Before we start in the message, uh, I wanted just to take a moment to pray for those killed, those individuals killed uh, in the massacre at the uh, church in Burkina Faso last Sunday. Some of you may not even be aware of it, but throughout the world, there is a huge persecution against Christians. Uh, Center for Studies on New Religions determined, and this is in 2015 alone, 90,000 Christians in 2015 were killed because of their faith. And the persecution is increasing. 500 million believers worldwide are prevented from openly meeting, practicing their beliefs. And that number is increasing daily. But the good thing is God sees and he hears. He sees and he hears. So if you would, let's just lift up those families who have lost those in Burkina Faso. Father in heaven, we come before you and we just pray for comfort. Lord, of those Christians, those families that lost husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, Lord. We just give the families to you. We just pray that you minister to them, Lord. We know that you see and you hear. And we just pray for the return of your son quickly. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. For those here this morning, in this sanctuary, or maybe listening on the radio that we have, our radio station, or maybe online, or you're watching the live stream. I want to welcome you to Calvary Chapel Grants Pass, where we seek out the Lord. We want to go deeper in our, in our walk. We want to go deeper reading his word, deeper in prayer. Prayer is so important. In my opinion, it is the most important meeting of the week, the prayer meeting. We want to go deeper in prayer. We want to go deeper in the word. And here we read the word line upon line, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Please turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 8. On Wednesday, we ended in verse 4, and we're going to pick it up. And as I had done on Wednesday, in the morning on Wednesday, I had... 15, 16 different verses that I was going to go through. I got through four. Last night when I left here late, I had about 15, 16 verses when I got in here today. That got cut. So we're going to read four or five. We'll see how far we can get. Acts chapter eight, we're going to start in verse four. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Verse 6, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Verse 7, for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. Verse 8, and there was great joy in that city. There was great joy in that city. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. We just pray by your spirit that you speak to us. All of us need to hear from you, Lord. Many of us are battling hardships. We need you in our lives. By your Holy Spirit, I just pray that you touch us. In the name of Jesus, amen. In 1865, Robert J. Thomas, he was a Welsh missionary primarily known for his work in China. But he was also drawn by the Holy Spirit to evangelize Korea. He knew that the people of the hermit kingdom, Korea, needed the gospel. But Korea, observing how Westerners had mistreated China, they closed their doors to foreigners. Trade with foreigners was forbidden. And if anyone was caught, they could be arrested, killed. Tension between Koreans and foreigners was at an all-time high. Robert still felt he needed to do something. He had a call by the Holy Spirit to go to the, the people in Korea. And in 1866, just one year later, Robert learned that an American boat, the General Sherman, 
was going to try to establish trade relations between Korea and the United States. He offered to accompany the boat as an interpreter in exchange for a chance to spread the gospel. The General Sherman sailed up the Taedong River toward Pyongyang. Robert tossed Bibles and gospel tracts in the native tongue under the river bank as the ship proceeded. Upon discovery, Korean officials ordered the American boat to turn around, leave at once. The Americans defied the warning and they paid with their lives. The schooner it ran, ran aground and stuck fast in the muddy bottom. The ship was set on fire by the Koreans and as the sailors and Thomas fled the burning boat, all were attacked and killed. True to his mission though, Thomas had leapt from the boat carrying Bibles, proclaiming the name of Jesus. And while trying to offer the Bible, the Bibles to his attackers, his head was whacked off by a machete. Though the Korean officials ordered all of the Bibles to be destroyed, many Koreans kept the Bibles to insulate and wallpaper their homes. In time, people came to read the words on their walls. And the rest is history. Today, 40% of South Koreans are Christians. And their nation has some of the largest congregations in the world, all proclaiming the name of Jesus, praising God. Praise be to God. Scripture tells us in Psalm 76, verse 10, that even the wrath of man Well, praise God. God is in control. God is in control. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. God takes what Satan means for evil and he turns it on its head and makes it for good. Verse four, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Therefore, an adverb, it means as a consequence, as a result, therefore is a causation. This happened because that happened. So what happened was persecution of the church, the new church in Jerusalem. It started with the illegal stoning, killing of Stephen and continued with persecution of the rest of the church in Jerusalem. It was now open season on those who believed in the name of Jesus. In many countries today, it still is. The floodgates of hate swung wide against the followers of Christ. And one of the chief persecutors in Jerusalem was a young man named Saul. Acts chapter 8, verse 3. We read it on Wednesday. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. The phrase made havoc is very fitting. In the Greek, it denotes a brutal cruelty, as like a boar ravaging a vineyard, or as a wild animal savaging a body. The newest rising star of Judaism, the zealous Saul now had his hit list. And he was savagely ravaging all Christians. Scripture says he was entering every home, every house where a believer lived, and he was dragging them off to prison, leaving behind Children, broken families, broken homes. His cruelty was felt everywhere in the city. Prisons were overflowing. In later years, wherever his gospel travels took him, Paul would always take up a collection. As it says in Romans, Romans 15 verse 26 states, for the poor saints 
which are at Jerusalem. See, he had a special love in his heart for the Jerusalem church, probably because of his persecution of them and the damage that was caused by his arrests of believers, a husband missing here, a brother, father, mother missing there. All the evil fruits of his zealous persecution in his unregenerate days. This must have weighed heavily on Saul. That is why I believe the Holy Spirit, after he was converted to Paul, allowed Paul to not only understand, but to write to pen. Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Oftentimes, we are haunted by our past faults, the hurt, the harm that we've caused others. But those who are in Christ Jesus, we are not defined by our previous failures. We are not marked. We are not stained by our past sins. We have a loving, merciful God. And the new covenant that we have with God through his son, Jesus remembers no more our past failures and iniquities. In Psalm 25, verse 7, it says, Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions according to thy mercy. Remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. And then also Jeremiah 31, 34, For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Thank you. Father in heaven, for those who believe in Jesus, who died on the cross. This new covenant that we have, based on the completed work of Jesus on the cross, it offers a true, complete cleansing from sin. Much more than the mere covering over of sin via the temple sacrifice in the old covenant, the old way. Hebrews Chapter 8, verse 13 says, By speaking of a new covenant, he's made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. The old passes away, and we are made new in Jesus. We are made new in Jesus. Our sins are no more. Saul, the up and coming pharisaical protege of Gamaliel, the rabbi, the teacher in the Sanhedrin. Saul was a Hebrew of Hebrews. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it says that he was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Righteous under the law. He kept the law. Perfectly. Yet, Scripture tells us that he kicked against the goads. He fought against the Holy Spirit. He fought against God as he persecuted the church. And the Jerusalem believers, they scattered, taking the gospel with them to get away from his cruelty. Thus began the worldwide witness of the church And the end result was the glory of God. Now, the word for preaching could be a little misleading in verse 4. When we think of preaching, we think of an individual, a preacher, an evangelist, one who is up speaking at at a church behind a pulpit. But the word just means to bring the good news, to announce glad tidings. Those scattered because of persecution, they were not preachers. They were just normal folks who wherever they went, they shared the gospel. Most individuals come to Christ, not at a revival meeting or some huge evangelical event. Most come to Christ in a one-on-one situation. A heart-to-heart talk. Regular people talking to other regular people. For those who believe 
in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, did you know that you are a missionary? Scripture says that all of us are missionaries. And some of us may, whoa, I, I can't do that. Well, we just need to tell people the good news. The good news of what God has done in our lives. It's really that simple. See, God changes hearts. And when our hearts are changed, then our lives start to follow. God changes hearts, but we need to surrender to him. Saul wasn't surrendering. He was fighting against God. That is not a place that you want to be. The church began by being a purely Jewish institution. The persecution that followed compelled the Christians to scatter and with preaching or speaking the word of God everywhere, the gospel went out to the world and went out to the Gentiles. We are the recipients of that. I'm not Jewish. But because of persecution, what Satan meant for bad, God turned it around. The gospel went out to the whole world. Verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. So, who was Philip? Well, there are four different men named Philip in the Bible. Philip was the name of two of King Herod's sons by different wives. You can read about that in Luke chapter 3 and also Matthew chapter 14. The other two Philips were early church believers, and they were very instrumental in the new church. First, you had Philip, the disciple or the apostle of Christ. He was one of the original 12. And then you had Philip, the evangelist, or as some would call him, Philip, the deacon. It is this Philip that verse 5 is speaking about. Philip, his, his name means lover of horses. His home was a Mediterranean. And Philip, like Stephen, he was an early leader, deacon of the church. He was one of the seven picked to help distribute the food to the widows. The early church had chosen their deacons well. One, Stephen, became the first martyr of the faith. And then the other, Philip, became the first great missionary of the faith. Philip, he had a heart for evangelism. And when the great persecution arose in Jerusalem, he left. And it seems he had a bent to evangelize Samaria. Now, Samaria, not an easy or popular field. Samaria was considered the land of the half-breeds or to some mongrels. They were half Jew and half Gentile. But if you've been listening on any Wednesday or Sunday, I think I say this every single time. God has a plan. God always has a plan. And in their mixed descent, the Samaritans actually formed a natural bridge between the Jew and the Gentile. At the time, Jews looked down on Samaritans, thought of them as second-class citizens, and no self-respecting Jew of his own accord would ever go to Samaria. Now, let me just take a minute here to go through a little history of Israel to help you explain the why and the how. of the Jew, the Samaritan conflict, for you to understand. Throughout their history, the children of Israel has struggled with conflict among the 12 tribes of Israel. It goes all the way back to the patriarch Jacob. And the nation, because of enmity, was divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now, the northern kingdom consisted of 10 tribes and it was called Israel or sometimes Ephraim in scripture. And the Southern kingdom consisting of the other two tribes was called 
Judah. Now, back to the Samaritans. The quarrel between the Jews and the Samaritans, centuries old. Back in the 8th century BC, before Christ, the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, whose capital was Samaria. As conquerors did in those days, they transported the greater part of the population and then settled pagan strangers in the land. These pagan strangers, they intermarried with the lowest classes of the Jews still there in northern Israel. And from these people came the Samaritans. In contrast, in the 6th century, the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom with its capital in Jerusalem. And its inhabitants were carried away by Babylon. But they completely refused to lose their identity. And they remained stubbornly Jewish. In the 5th century BC, they were allowed to return. And when the people of the southern kingdom returned and started to rebuild Jerusalem, the Samaritans came and offered their help. It was refused because they were no longer pure Jews. From that day on, there was an unhealed breach and a hatred between the Jew and the Samaritan. Verse 5 tells us that Stephen arrived and preached in Samaria, where most pure Jews would not go. But if you remember, there was one pure Jew who did go. Anybody know his name? Jesus did. He came and he spoke to a woman at a well there, and he was witnessing to her. And many believed in Jesus and were saved. And now Philip, answering the call of the Holy Spirit, He followed in the footsteps of Jesus. We are to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, that we are to be imitators of Christ. Imitators of Christ. See, he is always our example of how to live a godly, spirit-filled life here on earth. He was continually led by the Spirit. He was always doing God's will, always doing God's work, God's purpose. When we are walking in the Spirit of God, doing His will, we will be doing His work. Verse 6. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. With one accord heeded. The word for heeded, it means to turn the mind to, to apply, to attach. The Samaritans, they were a blended race. They also had a blended religion, combining elements of different religions into one. Jesus himself said in John chapter 4, verse 22, concerning the Samaritans, they worshipped what they did not know. They worshipped what was false. See, they had a religion. What they needed was a Christ. What they needed was a Savior. Philip gave them one. The name of Jesus warmed their hearts. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us what Philip said. Maybe Philip reminded them of that woman at the well, how she came to the well, weary, worn, unsatisfied, full of restless longings, and there she met. Jesus, and she listened to his words and then how she left satisfied with joy ringing in her heart. It says that she went back to her village and then she brought others to Jesus to listen to Jesus. And then scripture says that he stayed in their village with them in their homes as a guest for days. Maybe Philip told them, the Samaritans, about James and John, sons of thunder, 
and how they wanted to call down fire on Samaria and how Jesus rebuked them for their ignorance of the true nature of the Holy Spirit. You can read about that in Luke chapter nine. Those stories would have been attention getting conversation starters. And then he, Philip, he probably told the story of the one who came from glory, Jesus. How he lived a perfect sinless life, being guided by the Holy Spirit. And then died upon a cruel tree. But that all who believed would have redemption through his blood. And that he, Jesus, he was resurrected. Death could not hold him. The grave held no power. And that he, Jesus, the son of God is right now in heaven. Right hand of God. Verse 6 says, with one accord heeded, Philip had their attention. And they believed the words he spoke. Heeded. They attached themselves to the word of God spoken by Philip, just like the lame man at the temple. If you remember early In Acts, the book of Acts, Peter and John are going up to the temple to pray, the hour of prayer. And as they are passing, there is a lame man who's been there every day, of every week, of every month, every year, lame from birth. Scripture tells us that he was 40. And as Peter and John Pass by, the layman looks up, alms for the poor. And Pete, I got no coin, but what I got is something better. He gave him the gospel. And then after giving him the gospel, he said to the man, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus and in faith, That man stood. And it says that that healed man attached himself to Peter and John. He was not going to let go. He held tight. So did the Samaritans. The Samaritans were convicted by Philip's words. The Holy Spirit drew them in. Next, they would be convicted by what they saw. Verse 7. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lamed were healed. Verse 8. And there was great joy in that city. Just as with Stephen, demons and disease They fled before the power of God in Philip. As you read the narratives of the gospels in the book of Acts, Acts of the Holy Spirit, you notice a prevalence of disease and demon possession. In those days, there was a lot of it and it is no different today. Demon oppression and demon possession are at all time highs throughout the world. With our breakthroughs in modern medicine, it is now easy enough to diagnose the bodily afflictions for what they are. But society tends to discount, ignore, poo-poo the parallel afflictions of the soul. It is a chemical imbalance that makes him tormented. He was deprived as a child. Didn't get to watch TV. We now have so many more plausible explanations today for abnormal and aberrant behavior. We have phobias, psychosis. We have syndromes. 
There is always some medical answer. We now find causes for our depression and distortions in all areas of our lives. Everything can be attributed to some medical sickness. Society tends to not believe in demons. And even if the intellects and the doctors acknowledge their existence, they discount their activity. Modern psychology has done much to turn attention away from the spiritual realm. In all honesty, what is needed is Jesus. Jesus, he heals the psychosis. Jesus, he heals the sicknesses. Jesus, he heals the soul. The greatest lie Satan has told to man is that there is no Satan. There is no heaven. There is no hell. This world is all that there is. So get all that you can while you can. Live it up. Grab the silver chalice and drink from it. For you see, there is no tomorrow. There's no afterlife. Well, yes, you become a butterfly. Satan is working overtime and demons are as active today as they were in Jesus' time and Stephen's time and Philip's time. We need to be on our knees praying. By the power of the Holy Spirit of God, Philip was healing the sick, the lame, the paralyzed. He was casting out Demons in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Philip didn't hold the power. Stephen didn't hold the power. In the name of Jesus, that's where the power is. Oftentimes I'm here late at night and this is a big church and upstairs, downstairs, and I'm walking around. Yeah, once in a while you get like a little shiver. Hair on the back of your neck kind of goes up and I, I say it out loud, audibly, In the name of Jesus, if there are any demons in this building, leave. In the name of Jesus, I keep walking. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. They're not even in the same league. Jesus created angels. Demons are just fallen angels. Where am I? (laughs) He was casting out demons. And his power to do this, it gave tremendous weight to his preaching. Philip came as an ambassador for Christ. He was a messenger of the good news of Jesus. Back in the day, an ambassador or one sent of an official or king was always sent with the seal of that official or king to show the authority of which he came from. People always wanted to know the authority or the power of one's words and actions. Same today. All of Jesus' signs, his wonders, his miracles, they were all unique to show the authority in which he came from heaven, from the Father in heaven. The religious rulers, they questioned Jesus on his authority in the same manner concerning signs. In John chapter 2, verse 18, So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? And then in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 40, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus right there prophesying that he would be resurrected three days after his death. You tell me, what sign is greater than power over death? Philip was no different. His signs, his healings, they swayed the Samaritans. Verse 8. And there was great joy in that city. There was great 
joy. <laughs> in that city. For those uh, listening online or on the radio, they may not have heard that, but. <laughs> With revival, always comes rejoicing. When people get right with Jesus, they get that vertical relationship right with Jesus. Then they get right with each other. The horizontal starts to work. When we get that vertical right, then heaven comes down and glory fills the soul. As the psalmist said in Psalm 144, 15, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Amen. (laughs) The fact that Philip preached in Samaria and that the message of Jesus was given to these people shows that Christ, Christ is for all the world, everybody. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, not for God so loved Jerusalem, not God so loved Grants Pass. No. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John chapter three, verses 16 and 17. The Samaritans, they were half breeds. Some called them mongrels. They were unpure. They were defiled. Through persecution, Christianity was brought to the Samaritans. It brought the story of Jesus. The message of the love of God through his son, Jesus. It brought healing, physical healing, spiritual healing through Jesus in the name of Jesus. Christianity has never been a thing of just words. Words without actions, they have no power, no real meaning, no substance, no sustenance, which leads to the final gift of Jesus to the Samaritans. Christianity, it brought a natural consequence of the gospel. It brought joy. It brought a joy that the Samaritans who had never heard had never known before. Scripture just says that when Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well, that she just went to her village. Jesus brings us joy. We have joy because we have hope. We have hope in Jesus. The reason we have hope in Jesus is because Jesus is not buried in some grave somewhere. We have a living, all powerful God. Jesus, he is a warrior. And he saves. And right now he's in heaven at the right hand of God. It is a counterfeit Christianity which brings an atmosphere of gloom. See, the real thing, it radiates joy. It radiates light. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. This passage in John Jesus, he said it to a woman who was brought to him, who was just caught in adultery, a crime punishable by death, stoning. She was a sinner. Just like you and I. All of us, all of us are sinners. We fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus showed mercy to her and told her to stop sinning. I'm going to read John chapter 8, beginning in verse 7. So when they continued asking him, 
he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Verse nine, then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. She was a sinner. Caught in the act. Just like you and I. She was defiled unpure, just like the Samaritans, just like you and I. But God, through his plan, through his son, reaches down from heaven to us. He gives us a way for cleansing. He gives us a way for healing. He gives us a way for eternal salvation. Jesus, he's the only real true super, superhero that I know of. No one compares. When you give your life to Jesus, when you surrender your life to Jesus, there is no more Condemnation. All of your past faults, failures, they're gone. There is no more condemnation. But there is joy. There is joy. There is hope. Hope. There is redemption. There is salvation. There is eternal salvation, eternity. With God in heaven. You don't turn into a butterfly. All of us have an afterlife from this world. Question is is it smoking or not? For those who believe in the name of Jesus, Heaven awaits us. Heaven is not for the perfect. Heaven is for the forgiven, for those who are forgiven, for those who believe in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. And I just thank you for the power of your words, the gospel, the good news of your son, Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that you willingly, in obedience, left your throne in heaven and you came down to this world. And then you willingly went to the cross. You endured for us. You died so that we could live for those who believe in your name. I just thank you for that. And in your name, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As always, I want to make sure that there is an opportunity for anyone who wants to come up for prayer, whatever it may be. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're struggling with whatever. There will be individuals, pastors, and their wives up here. Please do not leave this building without doing business 
with God. God bless.